Okay, um, welcome, welcome. It's so nice to see some, um, some familiar faces um, out there. Um, so today, um, I don't know how many of you came to our talk yesterday. I mean, any of you? Anyone come? Okay, we, we, we might be repeating a little bit, but hopefully not too much. Um, before we start, um, we are going to show you a little film that we made um, for the Venice Biennale this year. The Italian Pavilion was doing um, a whole area on soil and resilience, and so they asked if we could contribute. Um, and we did it actually in a very short space of time, so, and, and we had to try and make it a little bit arty, but it might give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing. Um, and, um, and just if, for those of you that don't know who we are, we're obviously the Land Gardeners. I'm Bridget, and this is Henrietta, and we have Tim Williams here, also a regen farmer, and who we have just recently um, teamed up with. Um, anyway, two Kiwis and an English person. Um, okay, we'll play the film. The really great thing about making this movie is that we got to talk to all of our sort of soil heroes. Um, I don't know if any of you know who Ratan Lal is, but he's this amazing um, scientist in America who's done a lot of work on soil and soil carbon, and um, also Professor Scow at UC Davis in California. So um, uh, it was. Um <laughs> it's a messy desktop. Um, Anyway, one thing that Kate Scowl has done is she's done a 19-year study, I think I might have mentioned it yesterday, whereby they looked at cover crops and um, uh, compost and grasslands, and they tried to work out which was the most efficient um, carbon sequestration method. And they worked out that um, by using cover crops and compost, um, that the carbon sequestration was, was sort of a, it was a game changer, um, adding the compost. And so, um, which is a pretty exciting thing because actually there's not a huge amount of studies done around compost. Anyway, you, just to see that compost there is the delicious. That's what we do after six to eight weeks. Um, we turn raw materials into something very friable. And it's not, really, it's not really us, it's actually the method that we use makes it the most optimal um, environment for the microbes to actually digest the raw materials. And that's really the key with all your compost. Okay, I think here we go. What is soil? Soil is a, let's see, oh wow, good question. <laughs> there are so many aspects to soil. Soil is the skin of the earth that basically sustains us and keeps us alive. It supports us and feeds us and nourishes us and is the giver of all life. Soil is intricately interconnected with life. There is no life without soil and no soil without life. We are healing the life in our soils with our microbially rich climate compost. Soils are degraded because of us, 
because of humans, because of ignorance and arrogance, because of misunderstanding. Actions like cultivation, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, overgrazing and flooding all contribute to the degradation of our soil resource. We have about eight years to make a really massive fundamental change. If we don't make it within the next eight years, we start to uh, reach these catastrophic tipping points that will determine whether we go extinct or we don't go extinct. The, the, the stakes have never been higher on a change in human behavior. Soil has formed over hundreds or thousands of years, but we need to build soil now immediately because we have to speed it up. We've basically spent the last hundred years destroying the soil and we've got about 10 years to sort it out. It's really to try to accelerate this psychological shift of the farmer because the biologic shift happens overnight. We can take 30, 40 year old toxic dead dirt and turn it into vital soil over the, you know, a 12 month process. It's just so fast in which nature will recover if we stop doing the wrong thing. Nature works, composting, that's how nature works. What the land gardeners are doing is creating that biological complexity in a controlled situation full of life. It's phenomenal. In only six to eight weeks, we can turn raw materials into microbially rich climate compost, teeming with life. The compost builds the biology within the soil, which in turn feeds the plants creating resilient, self-sufficient communities of life. And it's this resilience which enables soils to withstand threats like drought, flooding, erosion. When you feed soil organisms a diet of nutrient-rich compost, they pay it forward in so many ways. Better soil structure that increases water infiltration, tighter biogeochemical cycles that bank soil nutrients, greater immunity to plant disease, if we care for the soil, it can self-organize and heal itself. Imagine soil is like a great cityscape, a metropolis. The buildings are built together by bacteria that make the very fine crumbs that are what build the bricks. And then it's the fungi that come in and these are the mortar that help stick together those bricks to build the walls. Soils is all about architecture and that structure is our resilience it's what holds the planet together. There's more carbon stored in the soil than there is in all of the vegetation in the world and in the atmosphere combined. And the role of carbon is very important in soil, particularly in well-structured, healthy, efficient soil systems. Healthy soil can lock away and sequester the carbon from the atmosphere, which contributes to climate change. Soil health is our most powerful tool in securing a sustainable future for this planet. 95% of the food grown, consumed by humans and animals is grown on soil. People are the mirror image of the soil they live on and vice versa. With what we know now, there's hope. I mean, soil health is the crux of it. We have the power to choose to treat the soil right. We have the power to lock carbon into the ground. Each one of us is a victim as well as a culprit. And from that point of view, each one of us has a responsibility. If we can allow nature to do what it's so good at, it's actually easier for us and we'll have less to do. As soon as you heal the soil, the rest of life floods back in. The health of soil, plants, animal, people, environment, and the planet is one and interconnected. We can all heal our soils.
So, um, is that working? Oh, that is working. Um, so we wanted to put that together really just to um, outline and under really r that, that real belief in our soils and really rebuilding the biology in our soils. And Bridget and I became um, obsessed with soil. We were cut flower growers for um, over 10 years, growing organic uh, cut flowers in Oxfordshire. And we were um, obsessed with soil health and started to um, travel the country and, um, uh, and actually globally to really find out who was making very good compost, how we could feed our soils. And we um, developed climate compost. And we called it climate compost because we really wanted to underline that idea of sequestering carbon, that we can all heal our soils. All of us can do our bit to look after the soil, whether it's in our garden or on our farms, to really look after the soil and enable those soils to sequester carbon. We, we have a problem of too much carbon in our atmosphere and not enough in our soils. And if we can use this climate compost to rebuild the biology and rebuild the, the carbon in our soils, then we'll go a long way to healing our soils, to healing our food, because of course what we grow in our soils is a complete reflection of the health of our soils and to healing our planet. So as Henry said, we started off um, uh, growing organic cut flowers in Oxfordshire and um, in tandem to that, I think it, it was, as we were also looking at soil health. We have um, some farms in New Zealand and we realised that there had to be another way of, of, of feeding the farms and feeding the soil and looking after the soil. So we started practising um, on uh, a sort of five acres in Oxfordshire before we unleashed it on thousands of acres in New Zealand. So um, what we started off here at Wardington Manor and we were growing vegetables and flowers together and we found that uh, we became organic after a while and we found that we had very few problems with pests and diseases and if we ever did, we were doing compost teas and that seemed to be fixing anything that was going on. Um, so we having, having sort of as Henry said, gone around the world looking at all the different people making compost. I mean, you think it's like the most incredibly basic thing. I mean, it's almost like baking a cake. It should be. But it, there's so much mystery around making compost. And probably because we are mere humans and nature does it so much better than we do, um, it, it just seems like this elusive thing of how to make the perfect compost. But finally, um, in Belgium once, we stumbled across this couple who are doing um, compost making in, in, in Austria. And we were, we, and they taught us how to make compost, turning, you know, um, this into, in six to eight weeks, turning it into this very friable, very digested um, compost. And one thinks, well, why do we have to do it so quickly? But as, as flower growers, we were finding that we were producing a lot of waste and that was piling up. And if we didn't deal with it um, immediately, it was sort of, it was never really breaking down. I don't know how many of you have had compost piles in your gardens that even after 18 months, there's still, you can still recognize bits of something in there. It hasn't fully digested. So we, th by doing it, this process, you can actually um, engage with what you've got and turn it um, consciously uh, by monitoring the soil temperature and the moisture. You can actually turn it to into something that was actually useful after six or eight weeks. And as a producer and grower, you know, these sort of inputs were, were invaluable and, and we, it meant that we weren't having to buy them in. So yes, you can you can see here um, the sort of six to eight week, eight week process. Uh, this is us uh, doing it both outside and um, inside on a barn. Um, do the next one. Um, as you see here. So basically, this is when we decided to jump over the garden wall and we started doing it on a farm scale. So I'm not sure how many of you are here to do it on a farm scale or or. Um, or just on a garden scale. Who's yes. here to do it farm scale? Great. Okay, well, that's what most of the talk's about. So. <laughs> oh, well, 
<laughs> okay, we're straight into how to do it. So uh, we liken it to a teenage party. Um, so to have a really good teenage party, you need the windows open. You need lots of oxygen to keep them all alive. You need l lots of lots to drink. So they've all got to. Y you've got to have a lot of moisture. And uh, you've got to regulate the temperature because you don't want them all uh, healing o keeling over. And um, the analogy actually ends there because really um, what we want in our compost piles is we really want lots of um, sex and lots of action. Uh, but you obviously don't want that at a, at a teenage party. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, that, that's what we're aiming for. So we uh, regulate our compost piles uh, daily, measuring them both for temperature and oxygen and moisture. And by doing that, we create the uh, peak conditions to proliferate biological life. This is us here setting up in our barn in Oxfordshire. Um, it worked very well here. If any of you have animals that come in over winter into a barn, uh, when they go out in the summer, that's the ideal time then to use your barn over the summer months to make the compost. So if the stock have left their manure in the barn, that's perfect because we then scoop it up and then turn those into windrows. So it works really well with that. I, if you don't and you've got your, past, your, your stock out on pasture, even bringing them in just for two weeks, uh, which Tim has done down in Cornwall, uh, meant that that managed to, meant we had um, sufficient ingredients to kickstart our uh, windrows at the beginning of spring. Okay, so what we do is a construction which is a little bit like a Toblerone bar. I'm sure you all know what that is. Um, and um, the reason for this is that, you know, initially we used to make compost in, in square um, uh, sections. But by doing a Toblerone, it's brilliant because the, the key for our compost making is having enough oxygen. And this creates a, a larger surface area. So what we do is it's... Uh, we go from um, we try and make a lasagna of um, carbon rich um, inputs and nitrogen rich inputs. So things like um, your hay and straw and leaves and wood chip is always if we're thinking about carbon, wood chip's always a really controversial um, uh, input because the more we've looked into it, the more we've found that the best sort of wood chip input is rummy or wood, and I don't know if any of heard of rummy or wood but that's the wood of young um young branches or young wood so anything that's grown in the last two to three years and especially if it's joined with um uh with any if with leaf so if you're doing hedgerow clippings or um uh, hedge clippings it's brilliant because it's got a perfect ratio of carbon and nitrogen and that's fine to put in your compost if you've got old compost because we're doing such a quick um, turnaround in six to eight weeks um, old I mean old um, wood chip um, or older wood it takes a lot of energy to break and a lot of nitrogen to break down old wood so we don't allow anything that's over two to three year growth um, in the carbon pot okay so and then the big the little yellow icing on the on the cake on the lasagna is clay um, and that's an incredibly important part of um, the ingredients. It's the home um, for the microbes. It also provides minerals. And it seems we try, we've tried doing it without clay, and you just don't get the same humified type um, compost and the stickiness in the compost. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you. I'm, some of you I know, because I've seen you, have come to our tent over there and felt our compost. Um, but I'm going to pass around some of our compost. And what you need to do is you need to squeeze it. And you see that it's got, and just feel the texture. Feel it's got a sort of a heavy dampness and a stickiness to it, which is what, and it, which is, can tell you that it's almost started to humify. It's got a lot of those sticky exudates from all that sex and death. Yeah, if you could. So really, it's, 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 and it's different. If you feel your compost, most of your compost at home that you get out of a bag, it'll feel like muesli or granola, or it'll just be dry. And it's, it's organic matter, but without the microlife. So these are some of the carbon-rich materials we use, as Bridgie said. Uh, we're using straw, old hay. Um, I mean, you can use the dreaded Amazon boxes. Um, and uh, leaves um, and 
so, I mean, uh, from a garden point of view, we we uh, clear sort of brown clippings when you're clearing borders in the autumn. But um, similarly, uh, out in the field, uh, as soon as anything starts to go become more brown, the more carbon it's got in it. So we use that. Um, one thing about, you know, you guys have to be the judge of it. I mean, it's not like a, um, it's not cookie cutter science, this is. I mean, some things have got more carbon in it and more nitrogen. Some things have got carbon and nitrogen. And so you have to sort of try and balance the ratios of, you know, which pile you put them in. Um, it's not always clear. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the general rule is the more brown it is, the more carbon it's got in it. And in fact, we, we actually now start to grow carbon accumulators. So we're actually become so obsessed with our uh, compost, we're actually growing plants for our compost. Um, um, and so things like cardoons, artichokes, Jerusalem artichokes, oats, um, uh, sunflowers, they, they are all very carbon rich materials. So they're really good for, um, uh, for, for building up our, um, our compost piles. And we'll even start to grow some herbs like comfrey and yarrow. We're now starting to grow in big quantities to go into the compost. And then nitrogen, uh, you need to balance it with nitrogen. Um, these are, tend to be the greens, um, as well as your manure, um, your fresh glass, grass clippings, weeds, hedgerow clippings. Brilliant if you can get those from around the farm. We strim a lot of nettles, they go in. And all of our piles always have 10% of very fresh greens. So we'll always do a cut that morning of very fresh greens. Oh, okay, so the, the question was, if you use grass clippings, are the seeds a problem? Well, the, the method that we use, I mean, we're putting in um, things like bindweed, ground elder. So, I mean, grass seed is there's not a problem. Because the method that we use is that we, we heat the pile up between 58 degrees and 65 degrees. That kills, normally, the weed seeds. So, hopefully, at the end of it, it should be okay. So... And in fact, the more diversity you can have in these piles, the better. Um, right. Okay, so the other things that, um, as I said before, that's really important to put in there is some nice clay. Um, hopefully, most of you can get clay from where you're living. I mean, what we do is, if we ever have someone with a digger, we get them to dig down and then grab us some clay, and we store it for... for um, when we are making compost piles. But if you can't do that, you can either buy it in um, from um, um, various sources. You can come and talk to us about this. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we use, oh yes. Well, I just noticed on your last slide, you've had coffee. Yes. yes like coffee Does that, I've heard that like kills fertility, like stops plants from reproducing. Is that, is that so deep or found? Not when it goes. Uh, no, when you when you put it through the composting machine, but process, it's great. I mean, you don't want to put too much, like a lot of these things. Um, but um, we've found that it's been great, and it's apparently a, quite a good high source of nitrogen. But but that's interesting. And um, um, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to learn more about that. Okay, so we've got okay, so we've got clay, ten percent of clay, and we also put back into it like an inoculum, so like when you're doing a, um, you know, making your sourdough bread, we put back some, at least maybe five to 10% of our old compost, putting the, putting the life back in. And or um, you can buy um, various inoculums, like um, mixes of various uh, biological life. There's one that we've been using from Austria, but we're actually unclear if we can get it in now because of um, Brexit. Um, but we are, luckily, we have a lot of compost which has that inoculum in it, so we're hopefully, we're just using that again. Oh, and yeah, the, and the last picture there is the water, showing the water going in. Um, that's, that's really crucial to keep the moisture levels up. You don't want the, you, you don't want the compost drying out um, for, for, for the life. 
Uh, so this is us starting to make it on a, a farm. Uh, we, we made it on a track initially. Um, you really need to make sure you've got a really hard track. If you're somewhere with a nice chalky track, that's sort of ideal. Um, and, um, uh, and at a slight angle. But certainly you can make it because then you can go up and down the track and you can make it next to, n next to it. Um, you can see here um, the Avant, which we'll be showing you later, um, and the Turner attached to it. And then this is a top text cover, which goes over the top of the compost. We're making these long, long, long Toblerones. Um, and here, this is, uh, this is actually where we, uh, we, we've so learnt by our mistakes. Um, uh, each time the scientists kept saying what we needed to do, we kept thinking, oh, surely we can cut corners. Anyway, we tried to here, and uh, we didn't have a nice concrete uh, surface, and it rained, and it was supposed to be uh, lime that had really been uh, hammered down. Anyway, it had too much clay, and then the whole thing became a horrible mess. So... Um, if you've got concrete, that's brilliant, but you do ideally need to have it at a very slight slope. You don't get much runoff, but um, it, 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 it works much better that way. And then this is us uh, making the compost in a barn. I mean, this is the ideal in terms of being having control of the process. Um, although it's very great having it outside because um, th the l light and the heat can um, be very good for it, but actually we found that Big barns are just perfect for, for making it. And another thing is, is probably a lot of you have got lovely big tractors that would um, be able to power a turner. So they, the same Austrians, they designed this specific turner to fit onto an Avant, but equally they designed bigger, uh, a bigger one that will go onto a, a, big, a nice big tractor. So um, we found that personally the little Avants were better because we could could get more rows and be more nifty within a barn. But if you're outside, um, these big turners are brilliant. And in fact, if any of you are interested in seeing one of the bigger turners, we were supposed to have one here today, but we sold our one to Wadston Manor, and Garth at Wadston is really happy for anyone to come and view what they're doing with it. Now, the, the thing that we do is as soon as we've made these these um, these windrows, they get hot very quickly. But like Henry talking about the teenagers, I mean, if you've put your right um, balance of everything in, I mean, within you know three or four hours, the temperature starts going up, and that's something really that we monitor like crazy for the first probably week or ten days, and then you can relax and let it just sit for for the next um, few weeks. But you can see here on the left, we've got just a turkey thermometer, which is actually works really well. I mean, you know, just one of those long thermometers. Um, equally, we we also use a long sort of th um, digital thermometer, and um, and basically any time, like I said before, any time between if it gets between fifty eight degrees and sixty five, um, we make sure we turn it. And you need to get the oxygen in. A lot of these piles of compost. I mean, we all think we're doing something good for the environment. Actually, if we're not turning them at the right time, they're actually polluters. So if your compost pile is smelling um, or if it's getting too hot, it's probably letting off a lot of nitrous oxide and methane. As soon as you add oxygen to the pile, you neutralize that and you, and you take away a lot of those greenhouse gases. So this is, a, this is also another... Um, uh, I think if you're composting and you're not doing this, I think now you know that you're doing the wrong thing. Um, you might want to start turning it um, because big piles of farmyard manure is actually polluting. Um. Yes, and I think the other thing about those big piles is they're often getting too hot. They're going over 65 degrees, and in which case you're just starting to kill the, the, the good bugs. We're, we're aiming to, to kill the bad bugs but keep the goodies by not getting too hot. A bit like pasteurizing milk, really. It's the same process. We don't want our pile to get too hot, which is why we turn it. Um, so you can see there's a lot of activity at the beginning. The temperature goes up uh, when all those microbes are really starting to break everything down. And as the microbes then start to rebuild, um, the temperature comes down and the CO2 levels come down. Okay, so here was one of our initial results. We did, um, uh, we spent actually three years working with innovative farmers, which was uh, fantastic actually, because they um, uh, monitored some of the things that we were doing. Here you see 
on the left, of course, is Climate Compost doing great things. Um, it grew longer. It had a longer vase life. The sweet peas did. And also, um, the really crazy thing was, though, is that we... We obviously, it was a, a scientific trial with um, a wonderful scientists that used to come out, but we did it for a year and we got these results. The next year we decided to, because these had been in a polytunnel so we could monitor them. The next year we still had the stakes there and seedlings of little sweet peas came up. So we just plopped them in where we'd done the trial before. So there was you know, a section where we had climate compost, a section with nothing, and then a section with the best um, organic compost that you can sort of get, I mean, supposedly. Um, and we didn't even really think about it. And we kept, somebody was going and watering them in. And then one day we went in and we looked and the, the section that had climate compost the year before and that hadn't even had an extra application with that somebody had just put the seedlings in was growing like triffids. I mean, I can't even tell you, which is probably the moment we started thinking that this there's something that's going on that's actually beyond us and what we thought could ever happen. I mean, look at those sweet peas there. They were probably about 35 centimetres, the ones on the left. We were getting sweet peas which were almost obscene. They were like 70 centimetres. And some, I think we even had one that was 85, which is sort of unnatural for sweet peas um, and almost a little a bit embarrassing. But, um, but the growth on these sweet peas was so extraordinary. And, and it was almost like, I don't know if any of you have grown sweet peas, but they snap very easily. So if you pick them, the, um, it's probably a bit like peas, you know, that you're growing in the, in the field. F weird enough, these peas were very bendy and they seemed to have a real strength and a sort of turgency of them that we started thinking they were sort of almost abnormal. So I have to say, something about what we're doing seems to get better with time and it's about it's almost as if the, the soil starts self-organizing and over time gets better. Um, so, yeah, it's, it was pretty amazing. We um, uh, had a test done, the Albrecht test, uh, done by Ian Robertson at SSM. Bridgie had had, the, had it done 10 years ago when she first arrived at the garden and then we had it done uh, just before, um, just this um, spring. And um, we found that over that 10 years, the organic matter had gone up from 5.6% to 12% and in some places up to 15%. So you can imagine when we heard that, we were just whooping with joy um, because it was so exciting. In fact, Ian even said that the, the soil where we'd been applying the compost he had never seen soil like it in the UK. He'd seen it occasionally in Denmark and possibly the Netherlands, um, but he'd never seen soil like that in the UK. And even the soil, he said, we should be selling uh, as a fertilizer. So, um, so the, I mean, if, you know, it, it just, we, we had sort of felt it was right. We'd seen it was right. But when we started to get these results, we realized that the, the science was there behind it. And um, it ties in very well with the UC Davis research. Uh, Kate Scow out in the States, they did a research over 19 years and found that um, the, cover, the combination of cover crops and compost is a real solution for soil health. The organic matter went up there every year by 0.4%. And uh, Tim will tell you more about that. Okay, so it's the whole thing of, is this the end of NPK? And... Um, in a minute, Tim is actually going to talk about um, how he's been using compost, this climate compost, on his farm in Dorset. I mean, in sorry, in Cornwall, and um, and not using anything else to grow his crops. And we're hoping that um, you know that's our our aim is that all of you out there will start making your own inputs with whatever you have, and feeding your soil and getting it to self-organize itself so that you do not have to. Um, that you do not have to draw on NPK. And um, and then, you, as you all know, if you've got healthy crops, you don't need any pesticides or then fungicides. So, you know, if you can lower your inputs, and especially you all know what the cost of NPK is and with, you know, on-farm inputs, it's not, it's not an, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big part of your farm budget. So if you can make it yourself, all the better. Um, and, um, yep, so this is basically just showing from going from, you know, farmyard manure into, into that. 
and we unlock, you know, and by putting this um, this co this compost in the ground, it starts un unlocking the nutrients. Here we have, um, you know, it's all about. I mean, I'm sure you all know about that whole thing, that symbiotic relationship between the between the plants and the soil and and th and the air. And I mean, there's so much that the plants can get from the atmosphere, and they draw it down into the soil. And only if that only if that whole system is working properly does everything work, and you can extract all the nutrients from the soil. And by adding climate compost, which is biology and life, they then facilitate that whole process. Yes, it's rather like our gut. Um, we're now seeing that that is the secret to our human health. So if we can get the microbiology um, working in the soil and really solve the microbiology in the soil, that is really the gut of for, for, our, for our plants. So they can then um, feed the, extract the nutrients from the soil to feed our plants. So it's a different way of thinking really. Um, and um, this is over to Tim now. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're incredibly, incredibly exacting and they make it incredibly confusing. And one of our aims is really, I mean, our aims is to educate and empower farmers to be able to make this themselves. And uh, so we've been trying to go through all these hoops of the environmental permits to do it. And yes, you can do it outside, but there are stipulations about uh, the h how, you c how you collect the runoff, which we could chat through. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm a regenerative farmer down in Cornwall. Um, I've got a couple of farms down there under my management. I'm a contract farmer. Um, Earth Barton is the main project. It's a 300-acre-ish uh, arable farm that's probably been in an arable rotation for about 40 years without livestock on it. Uh, the soils are pretty heavily damaged. Um, so I'll just run through this quite quickly. Um, so that's that's kind of what the soils looked like when I took the place on. Uh, potato ground, a lot of erosion, uh, excessive tillage. It's um, pretty typical of our area. And you can see in that uh, with where the straw is, it's not breaking down. So that's basically about nine months after harvest. So it's quite obvious to me that there's a real lack of biology within the system. So within my sort of um, regenerative sort of toolkit, you know, you've got your typical sort of um, mob stocking, um, rotational grazing uh, sort of style to maximise the photosynthesis, add the litter, build your, build your soil that way. Uh, then the plant element, uh, put down a 30-way blend. Um, I call it a grazable cover crop, and it's basically every plant sort of has a, a function within that. And, and, and then the final thing, I think the missing piece in the picture really is the biology because it's devoid of life because it's had so many chemicals fungicides nitrogen and just excessive tillage it's basically the soil is either dead or gone to sleep essentially so then I this kind of got me thinking when I met these guys at a conference a couple of years ago um, we sort of had similar ideas came from a very similar place in New Zealand which is quite fun and um, and it just sort of I kind of got quite excited about it because soil is soil is soil. It doesn't matter where it is. It can be in your garden. It can be on your lawn. It could be in a, a pot in your house uh, or it could be out in the field. So it's all the same stuff, works the same way. And so then to take it from the garden. And I think, you know, farmers are really missing a trick in not understanding their soil as well as the horticulture industry and even gardeners as well. Because uh, once you sort of understand how soil functions, then it sort of all the pieces come together. So then we're sort of, so so essentially this is, you know, the whole mob stocking idea is that you're creating compost in a field, essentially. So, you know, you, you're, break, you're trampling the plant down, you're feeding it with biology from the um, cow shit, and you're creating that basically infield composting. Um, and then, so what I'm doing is I'm applying the compost 
as an inoculant, basically. So rather than applying it as a physical compost, it's, it's just not efficient to do it. I've worked on organic farms before where we're putting on 10 tonne to the acre of farmyard manure, and that's just not really efficient. So what we're trying to do is actually breed the biology out in a, in a brewer, in a, in a tea form, and then spray that onto the field to speed up that biological process, essentially. Um, yeah, so we're just trying to build biology and, and maximise that biology. So you can see on the plant here, this is biological functioning. So that's your rhizosheath, so that's that interaction between the plant and the soil. So that's essentially how soil functions. It's that transfer of energy into the soil and then in return the uh, biology brings minerals to the plant. So the more biology you have in the soil and the more complexity of that biology within the soil, then the greater the function of that soil, the greater the photosynthesis, the quicker we can build soil, the quicker we can capture carbon, you know, so it's kind of going to draw us out of this mess that we're in. Um, so then this is kind of the composting productions. Um, I put the cattle in, we put them in for six weeks last year because it was very, very wet and that sort of forms the basis, the farmyard manure element. I mean, it's not a lot, there's probably about 40 tonnes. I went through about 40 tonnes of straw and hay. And I didn't use a feeder, I just chucked everything in there. So they were bedded down on straw and then I'd chuck a bale of hay in. And, and, and you know, if it's left behind, it doesn't really matter because it's just going into the system anyway. Um, and then I kind of, now I'm looking at growing, so you've got your uh, carbon and nitrogen um, elements, and I'm looking at growing specific um, inputs, basically, for the, for the compost. So instead of relying on someone else's um, straw inputs, we can actually control what we're putting into the, the mix. So then things like sunflowers and borage and buckwheat and chicory, and you can balance it. So the cover crop behind you would be really good because it's a really good blend of uh, nitrogen and carbon and essentially you could just go and harvest that and then turn that into the compost system um, and they could double up as your country stewardship if you get in quick you go about a month um, to get into it and you could so you could have a pollen and nectar mix which is paying for itself and then you could harvest that um, and also for infield strips so I call them bio refuges but for for sort of beneficials and pollinators, um, wild bird mixes, game covers, anything like that. It's essentially, it's just carbon and nitrogen and, and the ratios of that. Um, so then the compost tea, it's, so I've got a really simple system. It's a conical shaped tank. Um, I've got an air blower. And so the idea is that you blow air through into the tank and the tank's filled with water. That's about an, 900 litre tank, um, put in about 60 litres of actual physical compost, which is about that much. Because this compost is quite fine, we don't really need to put it in a bag. So you don't, because you don't, you're trying not to filter out too much biology, basically. And there's actually biology that will cling on to the particles as well, so you don't want it to be too fine. And then you brew that for about 24 hours. You can mix up the food source um, depending on the bacterial fungal ratios of your soil. So if you're coming out of an arable system that's had a lot of uh, soluble nitrogen, it'll be very simplistic bacterial dominance. But if you've got sleepy soils that you haven't really grazed for a long time and they're thatching up, then that's probably quite a heavy fungal um, balance. So you can tweak it depending so depending what you've put into the brew. So seaweed or um, leucine pellets is a good one, um, I think oat flour, there's all sorts of things, See, um, fish hydrolysis and humates, but you can tweak it to suit your system basically. Uh, and then I dilute that out as a 10 to 1 dilution and then that goes into a sprayer. And I, at the moment I've just set it up with a really simple kit and it's basically just an IBC with a Honda flood pump and then the trick is the nozzle, um, and it's, it works out about two liters, which is if you've been over to the tank uh, to the tent, sorry, it's a, about a bag of compost per hectare per, per application. So you don't need a lot. It's not about the actual physical amount. It's about trying to maximize the biological diversity within that compost, and that's the why the process is so special. 
So the more energy that you put into producing the compost, the better it's going to be and the better your brood's going to be. And then when we apply it, basically, um, so there's, there's this nozzles that um, I've imported from New Zealand, so you can see it here. That, that's a nozzle, you can come and have a look at it. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a low pressure, high volume sort of system, so it's about, puts on about 300 litres of actual spray per hectare. And it's just designed so that it minimises damage to the biology because if you're putting it through a conventional spray rig, well, not only will you probably have inherent chemical in it, but also that it's too tight for the biology and you'll damage the biology. Um, and then with this system as well, you can add other things, other biostimulants, seaweed, vermicast, whatever. And you can also put small seeds into it. So if you want to put some clover down or plantain or things like that, you can actually broadcast that at the same time. Uh, well, with it depends on the nozzle size. So it's about a ten meter width. Oh, but what you do yeah, wow. yeah. And so it's a, with the IBC, I do about three hectares at a time, and a brew will do about twenty hectares. And you need to brew it and spray it. So the brew was twenty four hours brewing, and then you need to spray it within about six hours. But you can. And this is what I'm looking into as well. It's create a, a vortex sprayer which keeps it dynamized, basically keeps it oxygenated um, as you go out to the field and spray it, and it'll keep for longer. And, and then the other way that we apply it is through bio priming. So instead of coating your seed with a fungicide, you coat it with positive uh, biology. So it's really simple. You just basically mix the seed in with the compost, maybe a couple of days beforehand. So that the that creates a bit of a relationship, and then we've just basically chucked it in the drill, and I've been playing around with ratios. I started off a bit heavy, but I think now about ten to one seems to work quite well. So so ten times the seed amount to one part compost basically, and um, and you can also soak the seeds in a in a tea in the tea solution as well. Uh, and this is kind of, I mean, it's a bit anecdotal, but this we've, we're starting to run trials. Um, so we're working, hopefully working with Rothamsted um, Research to look at, look at the plant health and also look at carbon sequestration. And we've also just um, doing, signed ourselves up as a demonstration farm with the Farm Carbon Toolkit, looking at carbon sequestration. So they're going to be looking at um, the sequestration rates over the next sort of five years um, because, yeah, we th we, we're we thinking that obviously it captures a lot more carbon. You can see there that there's a lot more uh, root nodulation, so obviously a lot more nitrogen. Um, if I'm, I'm, I'm guessing everyone understands what I mean by root nodulation and uh, legume fixing nitrogen. So that's essentially free nitrogen that's been taken out of the atmosphere by that pea plant um, rather than buying it in a bag. And then you've got greater root structure and uh, obviously increased growth as well. And that's that's me basically. That's the, that's what I'm starting with, and that's after about nine months. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so um, you know our our big aim and what we've been doing over the last you know six seven years is trying to create a toolkit for farmers and for growers so we're trying to take the sort of the the mystery out of it we've tried to we've made hopefully lot well we have made lots of mistakes and we're hopefully gonna pres you know have some information for you guys so that you don't make mistakes that you can actually um, process your you know your waste into something that can actually help and hopefully mean that it brings down your inputs and it means that your soil can actually function the way it should and at the same time sequestering carbon and growing more nutrient-dense food. So if any of you have got any questions, um, I'd love to hear from you. Yes. Could you, could you just explain what you do with the clay on top of your toe you know, How do you put that on? How thick is it? Okay, that's a really good question. The clay is the sort of annoying part. And we did try to get rid of it, and we tried to think, oh, maybe we can do it without clay, but do you know what? It is the key. So um, 
it is worth trying to find a good source of clay. Um, and what we do is often, you know, when you find clay, it's all clunked together. And of course, that's quite tricky to put in. So what we do is try and find some clay and either put it out on a um, bit of concrete. And, um, and Katie has been known to drive over the clay to try and break it down and have it out, you know, drying as much as we can and get it into much a, a, as a powdery form as we can. Sometimes, you know, um, it, you don't have the sun or you don't have a barn that you can do that in. So sometimes we make a slurry with the clay and pour it on in a sort of slurry form. One thing about clay is you know as soon as it gets water, it sort of clumps up. So the way we're going to show you in the demonstration in a minute, but what we try and do is we build our Toblerone or our lasagna and then put the clay on top, and we do we put the turn we put it through a turner, and um, and we put it through without the water to begin with. So it distributes hopefully distributes the clay amongst the pile. And once the water does go into the pile, then you don't get as much you know you get a bit of it globbing together. And sometimes at the end of making the compost, when you you know you sieve the compost, you'll find that there are lumps of clay, but. We try as much as possible to get it as sandy as possible, sandy clay. I mean, as you know, as friable as possible before, before you put the water in. Yep. Hi. Uh, yes, we absolutely have tried the biodynamic preps, and they've worked really well. Yes, so um, that's certainly, and in fact, some of those we are growing ourselves, like the yarrow and the valerian, um, to to go in. So. Um, that there's def there's definitely something in that magical energy uh, that that um, that we do use. Funny enough, the guys that we work with in Austria, um, uh, Angelica's mother, um, basically uh, worked with Enrild Pfeiffer, who was obviously Steiner's protege. So, um, and this this inoculum that we can buy from the Austrians is supposedly has come down through Steiner and Pfeiffer. So. I mean, you look at it and you think it must be, it must have, uh, they, it's a secret formula. So, but, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it is all biodynamic based and preps. So, and we have to had, we've done a lot of trials where instead of putting the inoculum in to begin with, we would put in, we put in the biodynamic preps and then made, um, and then made the windrows with that. So that's another um, another way you can do it, and what what's brilliant about that is most countries have um, you're able to buy biodynamic preps and or make them yourselves. Next question is: Have you measured uh, microbiome activity in a compost which is on an earth and is on a concrete? Yeah, th that's a, another really good point because, of course. Um, logically, we thought we should be making this on Earth, which is why we tried for years because we kept thinking a lot of the life will be coming up, especially the the worms and things coming up to to break down the the compost. And everything in our brains told us that's what we should be doing. And it, it actually, funny enough, we do this a similar process using a static method for home gardeners because actually, it's pretty tough to be turning this um, by hand. Um, and when we do that, we do build it on, not on concrete. But funnily enough, doing this method where we b we make it within six to eight weeks, um, funnily enough, it's something about the um, the temperature. It's much harder to regulate the temperature, and it's probably got something to do with the temperature of the soil. Um, and also, um, just it's much easier to control. And we worked out that... Um, you're you're using just as much. Um, you're using all the microlife that actually comes inherently, you know, on every surface of what you add in, and um, and when we mature the piles, we often put them out in the field, and that's when you get all those little brambling worms and things go into it. Then, but to 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 make it in that six to eight weeks, it is much easier to do it on a harder surface. Oh, sorry. Hello? Yeah. Other than the clay, it seems very similar to the start of the 18-day compost piles. I'm not aware of. Of Barclay, sorry? University of California. Of Barclay. Oh, yeah. 18-day compost piles. Right. I'm wondering how it's different from the takes of eight weeks rather than 18 days. Oh, God. Well, we uh, you need to tell us more about that one. Yeah. <laughs> and the other question was... The turner is, is it available for some of the compact tractors? Yeah. 
Um, you, yes, again, we probably have a chat about that. The, the, the two meter one turn that we've got uh, has been designed specifically to go on the event. And um, the event is a just, in, I mean, it, it sort of does everything on your farm or your estate. So it's not that you're, although it's an um, investment, you can actually use it for so many other things. Um, I, I can't remember how many attachments it has. So we use it um, throughout the farm, don't we? I mean, yeah. yeah, the Avant's really quite handy. So I use it instead of a JCB, essentially. And it lifts, like it's got a one and a half ton lift. You can unload straw with it and bed up and all that sort of jazz with it. So it is a really, really nifty little tool but you could probably get a pto driven one to go on your tractor um and there there are ones here in the uk but it's just trying to find them and because it's such a new thing here I, in europe they'll be easy to find and i know there's some guys that are building their own um like with truck differentials and things like that as well yeah Um, we do cover it. I mean, you don't have to, but actually it does work well to cover it just because it regulates the temperature and moisture. Um, outside, it's very good because it just you don't want the wind going through it as well. Um, so so it, it just helps us control it. Okay, so the first one was the brown to green ratio, and then do you use biochar? And what was the next one? Do we pee on it? Yeah, peeing's great. I mean, uh, I mean, weirdly, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that male pee is better. And it's apparently apparently male pee, but first thing in the morning. So all you men, you've got a job to do. Um, but okay, the the ratio. Now the thing is, is we sort of say roughly forty percent carbon 40 percent nitrogen and then we add in some you know inoculum from either inoculum or from compost and some clay but um every pile is different because you have to sort of weigh up if you're putting hay in how you know how brown is it it's is it got a little bit of nitrogen carbon and and you find that um depending on what your inputs are and often your inputs are quite similar i mean for us our inputs were you know, we could almost say during the year what sort of inputs we were going to have, and you'll get to know whatever your farm is producing. But um, we actually found that the method is to do 40 40, I mean, to do, you know, half off. But um, we find that putting in more carbon keeps the pile at a, at a more stable level. Um, when you add nitrogen, obviously it fires it up, but by having enough carbon in there, it keeps that that heat going for longer. So um, I would say slightly more carbon than the nitrogen. And biochar, yes we do, but we make sure that, um, you have to make sure you've got good biochar. One thing that um, we were really, um, uh, we were just buying biochar and putting it in, and then the Austrians who are very, very p precise, and I have to say they're always right, unfortunately, because we try and, all the time we're trying to make it easier for ourselves. Um, You've got to be really careful that you're getting biochar from a great source because you can actually get, um, you can actually, can, I mean, some biochar contains dioxins and various things. So I think it's a great thing to put in. It's, it's quite expensive. So um, you've got to make sure it's right. And as you probably all know, it's a great thing to put it through your composting system because biochar on itself, if you just put it directly into the ground, it robs nutrients. Unless, of course, you pee on it. I mean, that's one thing. You can pee on your biochar and put it in the ground. Or you probably the better thing to do is pee on it and then put it through your compost and then put it in your ground. Okay. Yep. Have you used wool at all in your compost? Yes, we, we have used wool. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a great source. It's something we like to use more of, actually. And what ratio are you using it with? Um, so... Yes, it, uh, as Bridgie said, yeah, we haven't used very much of it. We've probably used 10% of the pile. Um, obvi obviously, Dale's foot, they use a lot of wool in theirs. But, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, as a material, it could be very good for us to... Something we'd like to explore more. Yeah. Um, we've got two questions. One is, um, uh, if it what do you think to using spoiled silage? Spoiled silage? 
Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, once again, I think that, I mean, it's big. Well, I just use a, I mean, I've got the figures somewhere, but I use a very basic Honda flood pump, basically. And it's a, um, so it's um, a yeah, firefighting pump. And uh, so the hose coming out of the, I use an IBC at the moment, so it's got a three inch input into the pump and then a two inch output and then a 32 mil pipe to there and that creates the pressure. But I could, I could find the figures for you and, and, and work it out. But it's very, like the flood pumps are really easy to find and, and they just create that perfect um, pressure. We'd really love to uh, actually demonstrate it now to you. I think there's a question, but maybe we could. Uh, so, well, with my ground, because you can see it's it's devoid of any life, so I'm just pumping as much on, and it's it's more about management. So, you know, um, but if you're, it depends on your ground. You can apply it when the plant's stressed. You can apply it uh, at growth during the growth season. It's just basically what you're trying to do is is get your soil biology functioning to that point. So there's you can never apply too much. Some people apply it weekly. Um, I know guys in the horticulture industry will dilute, dilute it even more and just drip feed it into their systems on a daily basis. Uh, you can use it as a foliar spray to, to sort of push off pathogenic um, bacteria and things. So it's, it's, it's up to you really, you know, you can never put on too much, essentially. Um, so we'd love to do a demonstration uh, over here by our World War II tent. And um, if any of you are composting and are interested in having your compost tested, that's something else that we're, we're doing. Or if you want to learn more about it, just email us at studio at the Land Gardeners because we really want to form a collective, really, of people who are composting so that we can all share our knowledge. Thanks so much.